It depends where you are. So just to try to give a bit of a geographical layout, because it might affect where people want to go. If, if you head into sort of the northern and the inland areas, like up around Geraldton, once you come in towards Malawar, or down through Dalwalanyu and, and Three Springs, and um, right down through the central wheat belt, um, out towards Meriden, those kinds of lower rainfall northern areas, uh, you'll typically, a lot of those areas, they can harvest 24 hours a day if they want to, and some farmers do. They'll run shifts um, and go around the clock. So that's, that's the environment once you get out into the lower rainfall areas. But as you head further south, um, get closer to the south coast, God's country, if I might say. <laughs> but it's a different environment for harvesting. Um, yeah, so down down here at Esperance, for instance, uh, quite often it's actually physically wet in the morning. Um, and, you know, some people um, attempt to harvest around the clock down here, but for most people, you'd be sort of all hands on deck between seven and eight in the morning um, doing your servicing. And by around eight o'clock or to nine o'clock, uh, you'd be getting started. Um, but for most, for most farms, typically you'd be working around about a 12 hour day. Um, and in the areas where they don't get a lot of moisture, uh, They'll, they'll quite often roster a day off. Depends, every employer is different. It, I can only really speak for ourselves. In our situation, we've invested a lot in our accommodation. Our accommodation for workers is nicer than our own home. It's uh, two years old, it's solar passive, it's massive. It's got a huge sort of common entertaining area. It's got private rooms, it's all brand new, big kitchen, um, you know, satellite TV, all the rest of it, outdoor barbecue, porch and all that stuff. Um, you know, and for some people that's what they're looking for, for other people they don't mind, you know, being in a donger out the back behind the shed, um, just roughing it a bit and they might be more interested in some of the other features of the work on, on those different places. So, you know, for people who really want to uh, live in style, there's plenty of farmers who've got really nice accommodation. For people who that's less of a priority and they might be more interested in other, other sort of perks or aspects of the work, the locality to Perth or whatever it is. And again, I think it's just a case of contacting all the, I mean, there's a lot of jobs and it's certainly an applicant's market at the moment. So, you know, contact every employers, ask the questions. What's the accommodation like? What are the other benefits? Um, so when it comes to food, in, in our business, we uh, we always provide a, like a meal at night time, a hot meal at night time. We have little 12 volt ovens in all the caps, which are really good. So, um, so yeah, we just have a frozen meal, which is homemade. You know, it's either made by ourselves or some friends of ours who, um, you know, do catering. So they're nice cooked meals. We heat them up, you chuck them in the oven whenever you feel like it. You need to wait an hour for it to heat up, so the rookie mistake is stick it in the oven when you're hungry and then you've got to sit there and wait for an hour to eat it because it takes a little while to heat up. So, uh, yeah, that only happens once and people learn the lesson. But, yeah, so we have a nighttime meal because we're always working at night. Um, quite often you're working till you know, 9 o'clock or so at night. Um, so a hot meal's great, builds morale, keeps you fresh. And then when you get home, you really just need to you have your shower and just uh, wind down a little bit and uh, jump into the cot. So, so yeah, I think typically that's pretty normal to provide a nighttime meal. Some places do breakfast and lunch and your afternoon and morning tea the lot. Um, and it just depends. So, and, and it's often reflected in the wages too. You know, sometimes, you know, people will pay more but provide less. Other people will pay less and provide more. But um, it just depends what people are chasing. But um, certainly there's there's a range of options there. And, and it, yeah, it, to suit to suit everybody's needs. You know, some areas have a Sunday off every week, um, so they can uh, watch the footy or just just chill out a little bit. Um, pretty much, uh, that's that's starting to phase out a bit. I mean, I, I guess the thing is, for people wanting these interested in these jobs, there's a whole range of different scenarios, and it depends what people are looking for. And and I would encourage people to sort of, um, I guess, shop around a bit and find out, you know, who's doing doing the things that you like and what, what you want to do. So in Esperance, um, we don't do a roster day off because more than likely we're going to get some bad weather at some time and have to take a day off even, you know, it might be a Tuesday, not a Sunday. So so we tend to work our 12 hour days as often as we can, but invariably over the space of, you know, a fortnight, there's going to be one or two days where you either can't harvest or there's short days because you get a bit of rain come through or whatever it is. So. And look, when we do get those strange runs where we might get a fortnight straight, sometimes we'll just knock off early or start late just to let everybody recharge their batteries. So, look, they are they are solid hours, um, but you know, most most people I think are pretty aware of fatigue management and uh, conscious that there's no point driving people into the ground. You know, we need to stay safe, we need to be productive, and you're only going to do that if you're fresh. Typically, people live on site, so there's no travelling to and from work. I mean, when you're in the city, you might spend an hour on the road each way. 
well, out here, you, you jump in and you, you're in the paddock in the next in five minutes' time. I mean, really, the best thing, and, and I would recommend this anyway, is if possible, if you want to get there before the work starts or certainly before harvest starts. Um, in our case, we always like to get people there about a week before harvest starts so that everybody can just sort of ease into it, um, familiarise themselves with the lay of the land. You know, you're doing a bit of maintenance work, set out your field bins and that sort of stuff. Uh, people can settle in, you're not doing big days. Um, they can go and do the shop and they work out what they need and they can, you know, spend the morning at the shops or, you know, go and uh, go down to the beautiful beaches down here or whether if you're in inland, you might be, you know, going out bush camping for a night or two. Yeah, make a bit of time for that at the start. <clears throat> Once harvest gets cranked up, you know, there, there isn't a lot of time for just sort of having a bit of a jaunt. It is it is full on and it's our livelihood. That's what we're here to do and uh, it's, all, it's all hands on deck. But, um, you know, if you do get days off or certainly down, down this way in the southern areas, Typically, you might get two or three days in a row where there's just a bit of a, a, a front that comes through or something. Not a lot of harvesting to be done. You've been working some big days. I, I always encourage people, grab your swag, go out bush for a night or two, you know, have a, have a bit of time off and um, just chill out and, you know, have a, have a bit of fun um, with a campfire and maybe a couple of beers. Last year, um, two of our three chase, chase bin drivers were ladies. And, um, and they hadn't actually driven manual vehicles before and here they are driving tractors with a chase bin on them. So, so it's, it's definitely, it, it doesn't need to be intimidating. Uh, once you get the hang of it, like everything, most people settle into the groove pretty quickly. Typically, um, over the years, you know, I, I don't know how many hundred people we've had come through in these positions in our farm and all of them we've trained on the job. Um, very few of them have had prior training. Uh, I mean, obviously there's some skilled people that come through with a lot of experience, that's different. When I'm talking about the lesser skilled roles, you know, um, particularly ground crew and to a degree chase driving, uh, they learn on the job. The people we had last year, you know, they, they were city people, never been on a farm before. But they, I just, um, I gave them the induction over the tractors and the chase bin. Then they spent the afternoon taking turns driving around in the afternoon, you know. And um, so it's just a low stress environment. And then we just ease them into it. Um, but it's all 100% on the job training. I mean, the fantastic thing now is there are some really good introductory training courses that people can do which is A, really good for just bringing some skills to the job, um, but also it's really good for them to get a feel for what this job is actually is before they sign up to it. So um, there's the two work in Oz um, training out at York and then there's the Murex training at Northam. Really good options there. Um, and I, I really recommend people um, make the time to go and do that if they think about doing this. I, I think it, it'll persuade them that it's a good idea. Like it's pretty exciting. These are amazing machines that they get to come and operate. They really are sophisticated, they're beautiful, it's all climate controlled, you know, really good fun to operate. And um, for most people, they're never gonna do that again once they settle into full-time work. This is, you know, it's a really great opportunity to, for people pre-full-time pre work um, coming and doing this. And it's, you know, it's just a experience of a lifetime. You know, they need sturdy work clothes. So that's, um, that's, that's usually something that they need to organize. I mean, jeans are fine. Um, Sneakers aren't ready to go. You do want a decent, steady pair of work boots. They don't have to be steel caps normally. Some people might require that, but certainly most farmers, you know, just a good old pair of blunnies is to go. Um, sturdy, you know, a sturdy shirt and a hat. You need a, you want a broad brim hat. You need sunscreen, all the basic stuff. A big water bottle. You don't want to be sort of getting at work. The big days out there, you might want to take a thermos and a lunchbox. Um, and yeah, that's that's sort of it. The rest of it, you know, two feet and a half, but. I mean, the range of jobs typically at harvest is you've got header drivers, chaser bin drivers, and then you have ground or support crew. Um, they're, they're the three main roles. When you people have livestock, there might be a bit of livestock work in there as well, you know, if that's happening at the same time. Depends on the scale of the operation. So chaser bin is just a big trailer that you pull behind a tractor. So if you think of a car with a trailer on the back, it's the same thing, but big. Yeah. So, um, and it, <laughs> It, it's, it may seem intimidating at first. I mean, they, they can be anywhere from probably 15 tonnes up to 50 tonnes of capacity. Um, but really, you know, if you can drive a car with a trailer on it without freaking out, you can drive a tractor with a chase bin on it without freaking out. They don't go that fast. Everything's big. The tractors are big, they're safe, they're stable. Um, they're really easy to control. So um, people who are competent and confident driving, driving a vehicle, that they'll be able to drive a tractor with a chase bin hands down. We do it every year. They're casual positions, it's, it's, it's called a casual position and what that means is you don't need notice to to be fired and you don't need notice to leave. I mean, 
it's, it's always courteous to, to give notice and um, in both ways. Uh, it's very unusual. I don't hear of too many instances of someone turning up and either being sacked or, or just chucking in the sponge. Occasionally it happens, but more often chucking in the sponge than being sacked, to be honest. So, uh, but you know, the beauty of a casual position is that it's not a long-term commitment. If it's not working out for whatever reason or your mum gets sick or whatever, you know, um, it's, it's only purely that sort of moral obligation to do the right thing by your employer or your employee. That's the only thing binding you. Um, so you, you're free to do whatever you, you choose to do. Um, you know, everybody hopes it'll work out. Uh, most people will try to make it, you know, every, everyone actually will try to make it work. Uh, and if anything, perhaps one of the issues will be a personality clash with another worker or that sort of stuff. And that's often what sort of causes an issue. And that's just stuff that people have to work through. And it's, it's really good, um, you know, character development as well. And it's important, you know, for students who are preparing the end of the workforce uh, with their, you know, hopefully their degree, um, you know, to sort of get a feel for that dynamic. And it's just a casual arrangement. It's not your first job as, a, as an accountant or as a, you know, an ex scientist or whatever. It's not a permanent position. So you can get a bit of the lay of the land without sort of being too committed. And, um, and yeah, yeah, I think you develop a lot of skills working in a team in that sort of high pressure environment as well. So, but yeah, look, certainly in terms of there's nothing binding about it. It's a casual job. Um, you, basically, you can leave, you know, anytime you like.